Back in the 1600s in Europe, especially in England, religious persecution caused a group of separatists to risk a treacherous journey to come to a new land to search out a place where they could worship God as they chose. We've come to know this small group or a small band of Christians as pilgrims. Their boat was, what was their boat? The Mayflower, right. I didn't think you'd forgotten all your American history. <laughs> their point of arrival was Plymouth, Massachusetts, where they established a colony. They endured the hardship of their journey and then the harsh winters and the starvation in Massachusetts because they believed that God had something better for them. When they left their country to follow their faith, they did not look back. They were looking for a better place, a place of freedom. A pilgrim is not just somebody that pulls up stakes and moves, leaves home. That would be a drifter or a hobo or a vagabond. A pilgrim is rather a person who's left home and is traveling to another home, traveling to someplace else. A pilgrim has a vision or a goal and is determined to hang loose on everything else until that goal is in sight. And I want you to turn in your Bibles, if you have your Bibles, to Hebrews 11. I would have printed these verses on the sheet, but that would have taken me over to another page for about three, or three lines, and so I didn't do that. We don't use our Bibles because I generally print all the scriptures on your sheets, so today's going to be an exception to that. Beginning in Hebrews 11, Hebrews 11, all your Genesis passages are printed on your sheet, but this is Hebrews 11, verse 8. Everybody got it? Okay. By faith, Abraham when he was called to go out into a place which he should receive for an inheritance, obeyed. And he went out not knowing whether, whither he went. By faith he sojourned in the land of promise, as, as in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, their heirs with him of the same promise. For he looked for a city which have foundations whose builder and maker is God. Now skip over to 13. Now these all died in faith, not having received the promises, but seeing them afar off and were persuaded of them and embraced them and confessed they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. Verse 14. For they that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country. And truly, if they had been mindful of that country from whence they came out, they might have had opportunity to have returned. But now they desire a better country. That is a heavenly. Wherefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he hath prepared for them a city. Abram, when they, he left, he saw this promise of God, this city prepared by God by faith, with the eyes of faith. So we're going to look at the call of Abram. Remember, we're calling it Abram now because God will change his name later to Abraham. Genesis 31a, it says, And Terah, who was Abram's father, took Abram his son and Lot the son of Haran his son's son, and Sarah his daughter-in-law, his son Abram's wife. Now, at this time, it appears that when they left Ur, that Terah seems to be the leader of the expedition. And they were to go to Canaan, but they didn't go to Canaan. Now, if you've got your map, or look at your map that's in your, in your folder, you're going to see where Ur is. See, I don't put these things in here for nothing. They're in there for a reason. You see, see where Ur? Ur, it's a funny name. My maiden name was Erp, so I could put a PS on that, and it would be, that'd be it. See Ur? Find a Ur on your map. It's a red line going from Ur. They took, they could have gone, they, they went 
what they did is they followed the trade route because this was all desert in here. So they would have gone the trade route up the uh, Euphrates River up to Nineveh and then over to Haran. And that's where they stopped. That's where they stopped. But anyway, I, what I want, the point I wanted to make it, it seems that Tara was the leader of this group at this time. But the scriptures make it clear that God's call was to Abram, not Tara. Perhaps the call to follow God came to both of them, but scripture does not say that. It says the call came to Abram. Most of the family left Ur, and they went as far as Haran. And there is where we find the, main, the first stop. Stop is your blank. They stopped in Haran. A was call. Call was A. B is stop. Call and stop so far. I get involved and I forget to tell you. Sorry. Just stop me and ask me. See, they had partially obeyed. They had partially obeyed. And perhaps Abram was under his father's influence. We don't know why they stayed so long in Haran or Haran. I don't know which I'm going to call it. I may call it one, one way one time and another way another time. Evidently, his father had become very comfortable in Haran or Haran if the father was the leader. Abram had to break from all his family. He had to break away. That was what God told him to do. Perhaps it was a controversy or a question about who is going to be responsible for Lot. Because Lot, Abram was given responsible, responsibility for Lot. We don't know what the family dynamic was, but God called him a second time. Genesis 12.1. Now the Lord had said, that's past tense, had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house unto a land that I will show thee. Get away. This call came to Abram alone. Get away from your family. Get away from your family. Away from the comforts of home. That's second. Yes, his second call. And become a pilgrim. Now, humanly speaking, there isn't anything logical about God's call for Abram. If he wanted to make Abram a, a, a great man of influence and renown, why didn't he just leave him where he already had a base of influence? Wouldn't that make sense? Isaiah says that God's ways, God's thoughts are higher than our thoughts. His ways are, are higher than our ways. His ultimate purpose is greater than we can comprehend. So that's that's basically uh, why God does things we don't understand always. Abram's home in Ur, the city of Ur, which you found on there was a large city in the cap. It was the capital of Sumer, S-U-M-E-R. The Sum Sumerians had an advanced civilization at that time. Uh, in archaeological ex, uh, explorations there, a large number of tablets with mathematical formula and calculations have been unearthed. There was also evidence of a large library. How many of you know what a ziggurat is? A ziggurat. Not a cigarette. A <laughs> ziggurat. Well, they're sort of obsolete now, and I hope at some point or another cigarettes become obsolete too, but that's another subject. Um, but the cigarette was a, um, a square, a large square building, and it had tiers that built up and graduated to smaller. And on top of that would have been an altar to burn sacrifices to the main god, their main god. They were pagans their main god. And then around the grounds of this would have been uh, smaller shrines for the lesser gods. And um, Ur was a pagan city. So I think it's safe to assume that Abram, Sarai, and their family were all pagans as well. They worshipped idols. In fact, 
Joshua, you might jot this scripture down if you want to uh, check me out. Joshua 24.2 says that Terah, Abram's father, continued to worship other gods in Haran. It seems that in those 200 years or so between Noah and the flood, Noah's flood and Abram's time, God had been pretty much forgotten. So why did God call Abram? Did he see in Abram some redeeming quality? You know, God has for perfect foreknowledge. Did he see in him some uh, quality uh, that God required to meet his standards? You know, today the Holy Spirit uses the word of God to create faith in our hearts as we hear the word of God. But the Holy Spirit was not active in that way at that time. It was a later thing. Um, so, you know, I think God spoke directly to Abram. The Lord say, had said, the Lord had said to Abram. It does not say that he appeared, that there was a, an intermediary, that it was a dream or a vision. The Lord had said. So, it says said, so I'm going to say the Lord spoke to him, okay? Uh, I'm just going to take it literally, and I do that unless there's some reason, obvious reason that you shouldn't take it literally, and then I take it otherwise. Okay, now we're going to look at the what is called the Abrahamic covenant or the beginning of that. Now, if you look at the scripture printed there, Genesis 12, 2, the first word is what? And, and. Get thee out of thy country, go where I direct you, and then, and then I will make you a great nation. I'm not going to make you a great nation if you stay where you are, but you obey, I will make you a great nation, and I will bless thee, and I will make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing, and I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee, and in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed." First of all, he's going to make him a great nation, a great nation. That means he's going to have uh, progeny or he's going to have descendants. What does it say? What did it say in Genesis 11:30 about Sarai? It says she was barren. She had no child. Yet here is a promise of a great nation. Not nations. A nation. Not many nations, a nation, one nation, and that nation is Israel. Then he promised him perfect, uh, personal, sorry, personal blessings. That's prosperity. So he's progeny, prosperity, and then a great name. He's going to make his name prominent. So prominence. The name of Abraham is very prominent in Scripture. His name pops up all the way through Scripture from this point forward. His name is very common in the New Testament. It's used very often. Paul uses it a lot in, in his early writings. David and Moses pop up too quite a bit. But, of course, Jesus Christ is the most commonly used uh, name in Scripture. But Abraham, Father Abraham, is, is very prominent in Scripture. And he said, uh, you're going to personally bless others. And there will be blessings for his friends, for his friends. And here we get into the protection of God. I'm going to bless those that bless you. I'm going to curse your enemies. Curses for his enemies is number six. <clears throat> and blessings for all people through you. The ultimate blessing through Abraham was in his future seed, singular, Jesus Christ. Abraham himself was blessed through the redemptive work of Christ <coughs> by faith. And that's, well, that's pretty complex, so we won't go any farther with that. But God promised him prosperity, progeny, prominence, protection. These promises are what is called the Abrahamic covenant. It's the core of the Abrahamic covenant. And, but God's going to continue to enlarge on that covenant with to Abram and Isaac and Jacob. And these verses, but these verses right here in Genesis 12, 2 and 3 comprise the core 
or the basis of the covenant uh, that God made with Abram. We probably need to say a few words about what covenant means or what it is. In the Bible, a covenant is a promise or promises that God made to an individual like Abram, like David, or to a group like a nation, the nation of Israel. In fact, as we talked last week when we looked at that dispensational chart, we talked about that covenant God dealt with Israel based on covenant, only Israel. There's no, he made no covenants with any other nation. Okay? In this dispensation today, God is not dealing with us on covenants, any covenants. We are under grace. We're not under a covenant. We're under grace. So it was a covenant with Abraham's people who were the nation of Israel. And it's a one-way one co contract. It all depends on God. Co a covenant is always initiated by God. God takes complete responsibility for keeping the promises involved in the covenant. The conditions for the Abrahamic covenant, these promised blessings, was that he would obey or he would follow and he would leave his country and separate himself to God. That was the conditions. There's no idea here that Abram's, um, anything that he worked to do had anything to do with, the only thing he had to do was obey God, follow, follow God. Okay. Now we're going to look at Abraham's obedience. He becomes a pilgrim. Abram becomes a pilgrim. First word, these first words are important in these verses sometimes, and little words are big words sometimes, and this is a big word. 12.4 uh, begins with so. So Abram departed. It's a big word. It seems like that he obeyed without further delay. He understood that this was for him, that God was calling him, and he obeyed without delay. He left all his family except Lot. He took Lot with him, but he left the other parts of his family back there in Haran. He took all his possessions, and he moved into a territory already occupied by the Canaanites. And I love this here. At the end of verse 5, it says... Uh, and they went forth to go into the land of Canaan, and into the land of Canaan they came. It's like, we're going to do it, we're going we're gonna to go, and so they did. Now we're going to see the first, what I call the first covenant addendum. God is adding to more promises onto this covenant. Remember now, he's already promised his, his descendants uh, promised Abram a progeny, prosperity, prominence, protection, and now God promises them a place. He promised to give the, Abram's descendants the land. How did Abram respond? He built an altar. Abram's pilgrim life was one of tents and altars. It's been said that Abram was easy to track. Because everywhere he went, he left a trail of altars. What a great heritage. Can the same be said of you? What tracks or traces of your devotion to God are you leaving for those who are following to find? What mementos will you leave behind? When my father died back in 1978, my mother gave me uh, his set of commentaries that he used. And as I looked through them, I was blessed by his handwritten notes on index cards that he used when he taught. There were poems, there were magazine and articles, clip, clippings, outlines for lessons, all tucked into the pages of those commentaries. I was incredibly blessed, and it spoke to me of his devotion to God, even after he was gone. There was still, there was evidence there. 
And so the question is, what evidences of your devotion to God will kids find when they go through all your stuff? You say, I don't have stuff. We all got stuff. <laughs> don't tell me that. We all got stuff. And the, our stuff tells something about us. And so what's in your stuff that tells, is going to tell your kids she loved the Lord? That was, he, was, he was number one in her life. The, in this little square here, the life of a pilgrim is a picture of the life of every believer. It's a life characterized by tents and altars. Tents symbolize the fact that this is not our permanent home. We are sojourners passing through. Altars symbolize devotion, commitment, and consecration to God. This fuels that walk of faith that we're on. The life of a pilgrim is marked by obedience as well. However, the walk of faith that, that starts out right by following what God says can, can easily go wrong when we begin to walk in our own wisdom. It can go south, and that's exactly what happens next in Abram's life. He goes south. Because the next part of, his, of the scripture, we see compromise. Faith falters. Faith falters because of fear. The circumstances that Abram encounters is this time, at this time is famine. Our faith is going to be tested at every turn and in many ways. Abram's faith is tested by famine. You know, we've all seen the effects of starvation uh, as a result of famine. We see it on the news from time to time. So who could blame him for wanting to escape that? Perhaps Sarah had come to him and said, Abe, you know, we've got seven days worth of provisions left. What are we going to do? How are we going to feed our family, our extended, because he had servants, had a big household, livestock, and so forth. And Abe might have said to, to her, give everybody half rations today while I figure this out. That's pressure. It's pressure. Abram was under pressure. It was in the pressure cooker, and fear took over. When we're in trouble, we have to answer the question that Abram had to answer that day or that time, it was more than a day. Can I trust God, or do I need to work this out on my own? Well, evidently he decided for the latter because he developed a plan. The plan could be better called a scheme, but it was we're going to call it a plan. This plan was born out of fear, not faith. <coughs> Abram left off trusting God at the, with his fear. You know, we all have fear from time to time, but we're told in Scripture, trust God with it. Don't be afraid. Don't be anxious about anything, but pray about everything. Paul tells us that in, in Philippians 4. <coughs> a principle for us, and write this down, a principle for us, is the life of faith is lived without scheming. The life of faith is lived without scheming. It's a life of trusting. And fear caused his caused selfishness because he began to think what? Of his own skin, didn't he? He didn't think about Sarah as far as her safety went. Now, Sarah's beauty is obvious. Now, it seems funny to us that a six, at least 65-year-old woman could be such a looker that her husband considered her beauty a threat. It was a threat to him because what if they come and kill me so they can have her. So we're going to tell this little white lie to protect me. <coughs> Look at verse 12, what it says. Verse 12 says, Therefore it shall come to pass when the Egyptians shall see thee, that they shall say, This is his wife, and they shall kill me. And they, they will save thee alive. Pray, he's talking to Sarah. Pray, I say, I say, I pray thee, Thou art my sister, that it will be, may be well with me for thy sake, and my soul shall live because of thee. He's looking out for number one, isn't he? He's looking out for his own skin. And, and to be honest, 
Uh, she was his half-sister. They had the same father, different mothers, okay? The point is not how close to the truth did he come, but how far from God's direction had he strayed. Any time a believer begins to trust in their own schemes and devices, there are consequences. And Sarah, Abram wanted Sarah to be his protector. That was his scheme. That was his plan. But there was a problem. See, it's problem, the problem. Abram's dilemma. Although his scheme seemed to work to protect him, it did not protect Sarai. Pharaoh's men did notice her beauty and reported it to him. And Sarai was taken into his harem or his household. And, but the crazy thing about all this is that because of that, Abram got richer. Because he gained more riches because of her presence in the harem. But God had a plan for Sarai that protected her. It was God's deliverance. Did, did he have, did Abram have any thought about her safety or that she might be violated? It doesn't appear that he did. But God intervened on her behalf. He sent plagues to Pharaoh's household. And Pharaoh stayed away from Sarai. So she was protected. And it's interesting that Pharaoh recognized these plagues as a judgment. As a judgment, he connected it with Sarai. Um, I can't imagine that he didn't have any thought for Sarai's protection, but that maybe, like um, later when he trusted God with Isaac, and he's and remember he's 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 young in the faith at this point yeah, too, he is, so still, he's growing. But still, just ha having uh, no thought for his sister's, uh, you know. To, could be, could be. We, don't, we just know what the scripture is silent on that, okay? Okay. But anyway, God delivered her. It wasn't Abraham that Abram that delivered her. God delivered her. And um, Pharaoh put, there's a put down, the put down, that's E, down. Pharaoh, the pagan Pharaoh, dealt more honorably, and that says honorable, but it should say honorably, than Abram. He was, he was acting according to the custom of the day. That was what kings did. If they saw what they wanted, they went and took it. But remember, he did not know Abram's God. The believer was judged by the non-believer. Look at verse 18. And Pharaoh called Abram and said, What is this that thou hast done unto me? Why didst, why didst not thou tell me that she was thy wife? Why sayest thou she is my sister? So I might have taken her to be to me to wife. So he kind of put him down, didn't he? All right. And then he put him out. Out is the next one. He got put out. Abram was ejected from Egypt. But here's the amazing thing. He went away with increased riches and possessions. 19, the last part of that verse says, Now therefore, behold, thy wife, take her and go thy way. And Pharaoh commanded his men concerning him, and they sent him away and his wife and all that he had. Now, I, as I thought about this situation, Abram had all these special promises from God. When he came out of Egypt, he had been embarrassed and humiliated. But where'd he go? Where'd he go? He went back to Bethel, returning to Bethel. Faith returns to worship. And a principle for us here is no failure is permanent in the school of faith. No failure is permanent in the school of faith. God is a God of second chances. After embarrassment in Egypt, he returns to the altar. It's interesting that everything that Abram brought out of Egypt well, maybe not everything, but much of what he brought out of Egypt later became a problem for him or trouble for him. And now we're going to see how a person of faith deals with the first trouble that came. 
And that is this conflict. We're going to see that faith favors others. Faith favors others. Because Abram makes a concession. There's this conflict between relatives. Because of their increased riches, both Lot and Abram had too many flocks. Too many herds. And there was too little water and not enough grass, too few pastures. And so their herdsmen begin to squabble among each other and argue over whose herds got first at the grass, whose herds got first at the water, at the wells. And the end of verse 7, it said, And the Canaanite and the Perizzite dwelled in the land. So this squabbling between relatives was really a poor testimony to these who also were, lived in tents, these tribesmen who also lived in tents and depended upon also upon the same water, the same, the same grazing. So now we're going to look at the resolution of this conflict. Abram proposed that they separate, separate, and Abram gave Lot the choice of where to go, of property. Now Lot did not say, Uncle Abe, you are the elder, and you should have first pick. He didn't say that, did he? No record of that. But Abram gave him the first choice. Whatever the situation was, Abram surrendered his personal rights to Lot. And now let's look at Lot's choice. Lot's choice. He made a choice on appearances alone. He looked south to east towards Sodom. The pastures were green and they were vast and it, it was well watered. It looked good. It looked good. It had everything he needed to support his wealth and his lifestyle. And besides that, there in the distance was this large city of Sodom. There's no record that he had an altar or that he prayed. It seems that his choice was made without regard for God's purpose or even consideration for his uncle Abram. And he moved toward Sodom. When Lot lifted up his eyes to look at the land, he looked, what, he looked at what looked good on the surface. He saw what looked good on the surface. There's an expression or a, a thought that the eyes see what the heart loves. Lot looked toward Sodom and he moved toward Sodom and eventually moved into Sodom. Lot's eyes were on the sinful cities of men, and he went on to worldly success, spiritual failure, and a shameful end. And we will see that later in our study. Because Sodom, the city of Sodom, was known for its great wickedness. Cheer my stomach, Rowan. There are three kinds of individuals represented in this lesson. The first is the unbeliever, and that's Pharaoh. The second is the carnal believer, and that's represented by Lot. And the third is the spiritual man represented by Abram. Now, we see that none of these people are perfect. Lot represents the carnal believer. He's the one that believes in God but lives like one who does not. His choices reflect his love for the world and the allurements of the world. So that got me thinking about carnality in general. And in my humble opinion, I think that carnality is uh, a weapon that Satan uses to defeat those that are on the walk of faith, to keep Christians weak and diminish the influence of the church. And it seems to me, this is just my observation, it seems to me that this is especially prevalent among people or among those who teach eternal security because people believe that they're eternally secure and they are and there's the I mentality that says I'm saved it doesn't matter how I live Paul makes it clear that grace is never permission to live by our own flesh our devices our own desires that is absolute in absolute contradiction to who we really are in Christ he says in Romans 6, 1 and 2, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Do we continue to sin so that grace may seem more gracious? That grace may seem greater? 
No, he says, God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? So maybe this is the, this is the mindset of the carnal believer. And let's look at symptom number one of carnal Christians are not growing in the word. This is trying to walk by faith using the only the basics. It's like writing a book or communicating using three letters, A, B, C. When there's 23 other wonderful letters that need to be used, that need to be explored. The carnal Christian is satisfied with A, B, C as far as the word of God is concerned. It's like when you get something that comes in a box and says, some assembly required. How many of you ever done that? And you open it up and there's a zillion pieces and all the screws and stuff, and you try to put it together without the instructions. When all else fails, read the instructions, you know. But it, that's, that's how the carnal Christian believes. They're not reading the instructions. They're not taking into their life the word of God that builds their faith and increases their faith, and then, therefore, they stay baby Christians. Paul says here in, in 1 Corinthians 3, And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as to babes in Christ. I have fed you milk and not with meat, for hitherto you are not able to bear it, neither are now, are e neither yet now are ye able. So not able to understand meat because they're been satisfied with milk. Second thing uh, about carnality that I thought looked like the world in their relationships. Looks like the world in their relationships. There he tells the Corinthians that among you are envyings and strife and divisions. Are you not carnal and walk as men? Thirdly, carnal Christians build their lives on perishable values. He goes on in that same chapter of 1 Corinthians and says that our foundation says, now if any man built upon this foundation, Jesus Christ, gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, and stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest or made known. For the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire. And fire shall try every man's work for what sort it is. If any, a man, if any man's work abide which he hath built thereon, he shall receive a reward. What survives the fire? Precious gold, silver, and precious stones. Wood, hay, and stubble refer to the works of the flesh, which will be burned up and will not receive a reward. And if any man's work shall be burned, it sh he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so by fire. We're going to see an example of that further on in our study. The crisis with Lot is resolved by separation. It's important that Abram and Lot separate because they were of different mindsets. Abram was a spiritual man and Lot was carnal. Abram was a worshiper and there's no record that Lot prayed or worshipped. Abram and Lot had different goals. They were both pilgrims, but they were looking for a different city. They had different ideas. How many of you are familiar with the uh, the old classic work by John Milton, Pilgrim's Progress, written back in the 1600s. Well, he had different characters that were on this journey, and one of the characters is called Pliable. And Pliable was very attracted to Vanity Fair. Although he wanted to walk the Pilgrim way, he also wanted to spend time in Vanity Fair. That was Lot. He wanted to be counted with God's people, the people of Abraham with his family, but his mindset was on the world. After Lot looked, moved away, God had another meeting with Abram. Lot had lifted up his eyes and seen what the world had to offer. Now God invites Abram to lift up his eyes and see what heaven has to offer. <coughs> Lot chose a piece of land that he eventually lost, but God gave the entire land to Abram and it still belongs to his descendants. Lot had said, I will take. God said to Abram, I will give. And so we have covenant addendum number two. God piles, piles on promises. 
because he had promised him a land, but now the promised land is defined. He gives him the dimensions of this land. And the very last line of verse 15 says, and to thy seed forever. It's an everlasting heritage for Abram's people. And then he said, I will make thy seed as the dust of the earth. Your promised seed will be too numerous to count. Too numerous to count. And then Abram was told to claim the promise by walking, walking the land. He said, lift up your eyes and see. Now lift up your feet and walk. Walk it. And Abram's response once again is he worships God. He worships God. As Abram moved around the land from place to place, pitching his tent here, and the next night there, as God directed, he thanked God for the blessing. And you guessed it. He built an altar. As Abram walked the land, he took full measure of the blessing of God. How long has it been since you took full measure of the blessings that you have from God. If you do that, it'll. If uh, you won't, you won't have a complete list. You, you can't, um, you can't put a dent in the whole stack of blessings if you were stacking them up. But it will make you more thankful. It will be make you more grateful and develop a grateful heart. When you lie down tonight and close your eyes to sleep, in those <coughs> moments before. You go to sleep. You know the old expression, don't count sheep, count your blessings. It's a good time to do it. And just, and since hopefully that's not a long time, hopefully you don't have to lay awake a long time before you go to sleep, but just focus on the blessings of that particular day, what God has shown you that day, how God has blessed you that day through, through his word, through other people, through whatever means. Abram received incredible blessings, but we too, and promises, and we too have incredible promises and blessings in this day. So meditate on them with a thankful heart. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for this time we've had together today. I just feel like that I've just uh, just really been inadequate in expressing this lesson, but Lord, I just pray that you take it and Teach us from it, and um, Lord, just use it in our lives. We pray as we go on into the next lesson, uh, which will be a, a, a really a kind of a turn in direction that we'll, we'll just be blessed as well. And uh, Lord, I, I just pray selfishly for the weather today. I pray that we'll be able to have the class tonight. And uh, Lord, we just uh, love you, give you our lives, and give you uh, this class as an honor and a blessing to you, we pray in Jesus' name.